So um, I'd first like to do a knowledge of country. We'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It's upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. And we acknowledge the wider custodianship of country nationwide. As we share our own knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within this university, we also pay respects to the knowledge embedded forever within the Ab Aboriginal custodianship of country. So thank you very much for joining this uh, internal webinar today. We've got a very special guest uh, presenting and that guest is uh, me. And I'll be talking about growth models for longitudinal data. What are they and how do I run them in M plus? Now, I didn't send a, an email um, about what I was gonna talk about today, mostly because I didn't want people just to avoid this seminar. Um, because they're thinking, oh, I'm never going to do a growth model or longitudinal data or anything like that. I don't need to show up and listen. But I really think that it's good to come along and listen to these types of presentations, because even if you're not intended to do any kind of growth modeling, it's really important to know what they are, how they run, how you do it, how you can interpret the results, because it helps you when you're reading papers that have done growth models. It helps you have a better understanding of what the results are, what they're actually saying. Um, you can actually have a better understanding of, of when people talk about growth models and the difference between a growth model and a growth mixture model, you kind of understand what that is. Um, so I really feel that coming along, even though you're not intending to do anything, anything like this in the future, it's really important that you kind of get an idea of what they are. So that's kind of the main aim of this presentation is to try and understand what are growth models? And then finally, how do I run them in a program like M plus? So I'm gonna spend maybe the first 20 minutes or so just going over how they, what, what are they, um, how we define them, what they, can they do for us. And then in this kind of the second half, I plan to get out of PowerPoint and open up M plus and actually run through how we might um, conduct them in, in that program. So I've put a picture of the Hulk um, here and he's kind of like representative of a growth model that he gets, starts as a human and then over time, as he gets angrier and angrier, he grows and grows into like the Incredible Hulk. Um, and that's probably how you're going to feel at the end of this seminar uh, and how you probably feel at the end of running analyses in N plus, just like the Incredible Hulk. Uh, now, I, I am joking there about that because what I also want this presentation to be is kind of a um, demystifying of, of N plus almost. A lot of people think, oh, N plus is this really hard program to use. It's really fancy and I don't really want to touch that because it's just over me. But that's not really the case. Um, it's a very good program. It's very useful for latent variable models, for regressions, for Bayesian analysis, a whole heap of stuff. Um, it has its own kind of language, its programming language, but it's quite an easy language to understand. Um, it's, it's very, I don't know, it's very user-friendly so somewhat. Um, but it makes sense. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, as I show you some examples, you'll see how it makes sense and, and it won't be too uh, intimidating. So let's get stuck straight into it. Um, so we're gonna be talking about growth models, but first I'd like to talk about uh, multi-level models and people are probably wondering, okay, why the hell are you talking about multi-level models when we're talking about growth models? And hopefully that will make sense um, in the future as we get through the presentation. But first, and this is a bit of a theme of this presentation, um, there's a lot of confusion around names and about the naming conventions of these models, particularly uh, growth models and multi-level models. So they're often referred to a whole, as a whole bunch of different things. So some people call them hierarchical linear models, linear mixed effects models, mixed models, nested data models, random coefficient models, random effects models, random parameter models, generalized or general linear mixed models, and, and so on. Um, but essentially it's all the same. This is just the same, different names for the same thing. Um, and as you'll hear about later on, there are different names for different things, but they are very similar. So I don't know why statisticians do this. They just like to name, name things and they give the same thing many different names. So you're probably all wondering, okay, what is a multi-level model? And really, if you're familiar with linear regression, then you'll probably know more uh, than you think about multi-level models. A multi-level model is kind of like a linear regression. We want to so show an association between a dependent and an independent variable. 
And we want to try and model that as well as potentially looking at the influence of other predictors or other covariates in the model. What a multi-level model is, is kind of an extension of a linear model or a logistic regression model. It just extends it in order to deal with what's known as clustered or nested data. Um, and so what is clustered and nested data? Essentially, when I think of multi-level models, I think of nested data and then I start thinking of those nested dolls where you have kind of like one doll within another. And here's an example of that uh, in the Beatles. And essentially, nested data has multiple levels and each of those levels fits within each other. So what you have then is you have a kind of dependence in the data structure where data at a lower level is really dependent or shared or has some kind of correlation with a higher level. Um, and if you don't take into account this kind of dependence, then your, your models will probably be incorrect because you'll have really like underestimated standard errors. Uh, you're more likely to find a significant result, even though a significant result actually might not be there. So when I think of multi-level models, I think of nested data, and then I think of the Beatles. So just to try and um, provide more examples of what a nested data is or nested data structure. Uh, here's an example of what one is, and it's very kind of like the classical nested data structure. We deal with this stuff all the time at Matilda, and that is school level data. So here you can see when we kind of uh, get average scores on a test from different classes, and we might recruit different classes from different schools, we can see that classes always sit within a school. And there is some kind of shared variance amongst all these classes purely by the nature that they're from the same school. So we need to take into account that shared variance when running our models. But the beauty of multi-level data is not just that we're taking care of that kind of shared variance, but we can then run different predictors of average class score at the class level so whether or not the, the different teachers at different classes have an effect on the class scores, or we can look at it class scores predictors at the school level. So whether or not the school is a private school, a public school, or is it uh, from different socioeconomic areas, um, a whole bunch of different things. So how that nested data structure then looks in, um, an actual data, a data set like Excel, is we have what's known as long format, where we have a small number of columns, but a large number of rows. And you can see the nested structure within this long format is that we have school one, and we have three rows representing school one, which all represent the three classes which are nested within schools. And then we have our average class scores. And so this is how it would look. We'd have a really long data set with a very few columns. Um, and that's how you can actually tell that it is a nested data set usually, and a multi-level model is suitable for it because you get it in this long format. Now, this is only kind of a very simple example with two levels, so the school level and the class level. We can get more fancy and include an additional level if you want. Um, probably the best example here is students within classes, which are then within schools, and you might have three levels of nesting, which you can then take into account using a three level model and so on and so forth. And you can have predictors related to both individual students, predictors related to classes and predictors related to schools all within the same model. So we can answer a lot of different questions about uh, uh, what an average class score is and the predictors of, of class scores. So what does this have anything to do with growth models? Well, if you think about it, um, Longitudinal data, which is what we want to look at in terms of growth models, can also be thought of as a nested data set. So we just swap out, instead of having schools, we might look at participants and we might have, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 participants, and then we might measure them three times. And so the classes then becomes time points, the measurement time points. And so when we, have, when we look at it in the data set, we have a very kind of long data set where individual people are represented by multiple rows, and that is each time that they are measured. And here we've got like an example of the K10 score, the psychological distress scale, and we might wanna look at 
how that changes over time, taking into account that there is a shared relationship because it's the same person measured over time. So this is in effect a growth model. And you can use multi-level models to run growth models in order to look at the differences in K10 scores over time, taking into account the nested structure of, uh, of the person, the correlated nature of having multiple measures over time. And then you can also look at predictors of K10 scores at the person level and then also at the individual time level. <coughs> now, when I talk about growth models, there's the added level of confusion that multi-level models can be growth models, as I just explained, and you can look at longitudinal relationships in the multi-level framework, but not all growth models are multi-level models. So everyone's probably, I wish, I wish I'd had a better format for this because it's hard to see everyone's confusion. Um, but, you know, hopefully you're following along. And if not, maybe you can just chuck a question in the, the chat or the question and answer column and I'll try and repeat myself. So what does this mean? Well, my definition of growth models um, is basically referring to an examination of, of between persons, so the group predictors or group differences in within person or individual change. So it's taking longitudinal data and it's looking at group difference, so male, female, old, young, um, whether you're part of an intervention or control and looking at how those group differences might show up in differences in terms of within personal individual change. So, oh, there's a question answer. No, great job explaining it. Thanks, Marie. Um, so essentially a growth model is really focusing on trajectories of change. Now, what do I mean by multi-level models can be growth models, but not all growth models are multi-level models. Well, what you can do in terms of a growth model is use two different frameworks. And in certain circumstances, if you use these two different frameworks, you can get the exact same results. So why would anyone want to do, have two different frameworks to do the exact same thing? Well, hopefully I'll explain that more in, a bit, in, in detail in a bit later. But essentially the two frameworks are the multi-level framework, which I just mentioned. So using that nested data structure, having that long data set where you have, you know, people represented by multiple rows. Or you can use another framework called the structural equation modeling framework. Sometimes it's called the multivariate framework, but I prefer structural equation modeling framework. And this is used to kind of estimate growth models, but instead of using a multi-level framework, they use latent variables. And so that's why it's often called latent growth or latent curve models. So moving forward, I'll refer to uh, latent growth models as the ones the growth model conducted in structural equation modeling and multi-level growth models, which are done obviously in multi-level framework. So just a bit more explanation of what a structure, oh, oh, by the way, the main difference between these two is essentially how the data are structured. So as I described before, a multi-level structure has a lot of rows, very few columns. Um, individuals are represented multiple times, depending on the number of times that they're uh, tested. And so you really only have one dependent variable on multiple levels. But for a structural equation modeling approach, you essentially grow the data. So you're growing it from long data to now what's known as a wide data format. And I think a wide data format, most people are actually more familiar with wide data at Matilda than they are with the long data format. I don't know why. Um, I think a lot of psychology courses deal with kind of longer data. No, sorry, wider data. Essentially what we're doing in terms of converting long data to wide data is we're taking each time point and we're giving it its own row. Sorry, its own column, I'm getting confused myself. Each time the uh, measure is repeated, it gets a new uh, column and individuals are treated as a single row. So we don't have a multi-level structure anymore. We just have a single level structure but we have the data represented by multiple dependent variables. And what the structural equation modeling approach does is it takes those multiple dependent variables and it uses latent variables in order to represent the shared, you know, the correlated nature between all these dependent variables over time in the same individual. So essentially what we're seeing 
is that these multiple dependent variables are becoming indicators of two, you know, generally two latent factors that represent the intercept. And the intercept is basically um, the, the score that a person has when they start, traditionally when they start, but it can be anywhere, when they start in terms of their growth. And then we have a second latent variable which represents the slope, that is the change. So how a person changes over time. And these two things can be correlated because where a person starts can also affect how, they, how fast or how slow they change over time. And this is essentially um, the latent growth model. So what we have is we have an intercept and a slope and each of these has a mean and a variance. So a mean is mean, means that we have, you know, a mean K10 score for the, title, for, the, for the population that we're looking at. But we also have a variance around that mean because we know that people can vary in terms of where they start. And so some people start really high on the K10, some people start really low on the K10, but we also have that mean. So an average of where they start. The same thing for the slope. We have a mean slope. So in, in terms of the average change over time, we have a slope, one single slope, um, and we can see where people change on there. But we also have variance around that slope. And so people can change in terms of change really fast or really slow or whatever. Um, and so we have these two variances that we want to predict. So we want to figure out, are there certain groups that have higher or lower intercepts? Are there certain groups that have quicker or, or slower change over time? And so this is when we incorporate those predictors like an intervention group versus control. We can see, okay, do intervention and control, do they differ in terms of their intercepts? Usually would like to say no if it was uh, properly randomized because people all start at the same level. But we'd want to see a difference in the slope where the intervention might not change as fast. It might not, um, sorry, if we're talking about K10 or probably, we want to see it change more, but going down. So in comparison to control, depending on the intervention that we give. Ah, um, so Chris, you just asked a question. Um, can you please explain what a latent variable is? So essentially what a latent variable is, is a variable that we make up. Um, it's, it's a variable that is not measured, but it represents some of the things that we do measure. So it's basically a way of saying, okay, if we have these five or six different variables that are all correlated, how can we re better represent that correlation between those variables in a more parsimonious way using only a single variable? And if those variables equation modeling framework, only because there are certain things that you can do in it that are easier um, or that it can handle better um, in comparison kind of to the latent, uh, sorry, the multi-level framework. Um, and so what do I mean by some of those advantages? Well, in a latent variable framework, um, you can, the, it more easily handles kind of multivariate analysis and looking at structural relationships between multiple outcomes. So we can look at change in alcohol use and how change in alcohol use might be related to change in parenting over time. Now, I know a few people at Matilda have done a similar kind of analysis like this. It's often called parallel process growth models, where we have kind of two processes, two growth processes going on at the same time. So we might have alcohol use from grade seven all the way through to grade 10, the intercept and the slope. So the starting point and how it changes. And then we also have additional set of variables looking at kind of parental autonomy granting. Uh, from grade seven to grade 10, and we have there the intercept and the slope. So what these kind of uh, models would be most interested in is looking at the relationships between these latent variables that represent the intercepts and the slope, so the change. And we can see, okay, whether or not um, does change in autonomy. So as you become more, as your parenting styles become more autonomous to your children as you get, as they get older, is that associated with whether or not they're more or less likely to use alcohol or abuse alcohol uh, and so on and so forth. And also look at whether or not the starting point of alcohol abuse um, is, a, is some kids who are more likely to be using alcohol at the start. Do they have, do they have higher or lower autonomy at the start? 
all these different types of interact interactions and relationships that you can look at. So that's one advantage and it's much easier to do this type of analysis in the structural equation modeling framework rather than the multi-level framework. Uh, the second thing, the second advantage is that we can estimate latent factors. As I said, we've already estimated two latent factors, the intercept and the slope, but we can estimate more latent factors and then we can incorporate those as either the repeated outcomes or as predictors. So I often bang on about this idea of the structure of psychopathology and that there is some kind of higher order structure that represents kind of the comorbidity or the shared correlation amongst a variety of disorders, uh, mental disorders. So for instance, say we have, you know, four uh, disorders representing depression, GAD, social anxiety, uh, panic disorder they're all very strongly correlated. And if we assume that they might represent this kind of latent structure that has, it indicates the person's liability to experience all of these kind of anxiety, depression type disorders, then we can model those at each time point if we have diagnostic variables at each time point. And once we've modeled those, we can then look at the change in the propensity to experience internalizing over time by just focusing on that shared latent variable. So again, we can plug in the intercept and the slope and we can look at how internalizing might change over time. And if we have a, a, a kind of an RCT where we have an intervention or control where we're looking to change internalizing in general, uh, we can then look at the predictors of this intercept and slope, which might be whether they're part of an intervention or control and to see whether or not the intercepts change, uh, sorry, see whether or not their, their slope uh, is different for people in the intervention versus the control on internalizing. So it's just another level that you can incorporate into your analyses. Um, a third point is we can incorporate uh, categorical latent factors. So the latent factors I've been talking about previously are all, re all represented by continuous uh, distributions. So they have a mean and they have a, a variance. So they're all kind of continuous distributions, normally distributed. But there are things called categorical latent variables. And basically they're used to assess whether or not there are different classes of people in the population, which can be defined by their different growth trajectories. So this is sometimes called growth mixture modeling. Um, and here's a, a fancy picture of that. So here we'd have the same straightforward kind of basic uh, growth model where we're looking at four time points of K10 scores, we have an intercept and we have a slope. But instead we want to regress this categorical latent variable on the intercept and slope to see if there are different classes of people that might change over time. So this was a study I did back in 2012 um, where I looked at this very thing. Um, we had data from an online uh, CBT intervention that was administered at CRUFAD. Um, and we had K10 scores measured at each lesson and there was about five lessons. And I wanted to see whether or not people differed in terms of their change over those five lessons to something more meaningful. So I, I ran that model um, where I plugged in a categorical latent variable explaining kind of the intercept and slope. And I found these two classes, uh, which I kind of labeled as low responders in the blue. And they kind of generally started much higher than the red and they had a flatter curve. They didn't change as much over time um, in comparison to these red people who were kind of like the, the responders where they had, you know, it's still pretty high K10 score, but a lower than the blue group. And they showed a, a, an on average a 10 point decrease over those five lessons. What was interesting is that majority of people, 75% of these were the responders um, and only 25% were the low responders. So once we've kind of identified these two classes, we can then figure out what the predictors are of that class membership. So what makes someone a responder? What makes someone a low responder? Um, and so, where were, yep. And so that kind of shows how you can incorporate categorical latent variables into these models, which is much deeper, easier to do than than uh, in the structural equation modeling framework than in the multi-level framework. 
And the final kind of point, and these aren't these aren't an exhaustive list of advantages. There are other advantages, and also disadvantages as well. But these are the kind of the main things that um, I want to highlight because these are the things that we are interested in doing at Matilda with our data. Um, but the final point, which I think is um, an advantage for using a structural equation modeling approach, is that we it's more well suited to test for mediation effects. So that is uh, whether a treatment uh, impacts or alters the trajectory of a mediating high risk behavior that then reduces the onset of a longer term outcome. Uh, so here is even more fancier picture of that going on. Um, and this has a couple of things going on where we have maternal depression, um, which is measured by scores, uh, four different scores measured at kind of antenatal and postnatally. Uh, but the maternal depression latent variable represents kind of the, the correlation or the similarities across all those scores. And then it's that latent variable that's used as kind of like the starting variable in the starting independent variable in the mediation model. And it's saying, okay, whether or not maternal scores influence CP's uh, conduct problems in children, does it influence the intercept and does it influence the change in conduct problems from four years all the way through 16 years in the children? And then there is another relationship looking at does that then, does that change in conduct problems, is that associated with young adult depression at 18 years? So it's this mediation of conduct problems between the relationship of maternal depression and young adult depression at 18 years. But the mediating variable is being represented here by the growth factors. So Kath just asked a quick question of what sample sizes are we talking about to do latent analysis of mediators and moderators of outcome? Pretty large sample sizes. Um, <laughs> I can't give you an exact number um, without doing kind of like a power analysis of sample size calculator, but most of the time, uh, the benefits of using structural equation modeling are best suited for larger sample sizes. So this is, as, well, this is also a disadvantage of structural equation modeling is that you do need large sample sizes, whereas multi-level modeling, you don't need as large a sample sizes that you do tend to use, I mean, I'm talking maybe 500 or more uh, people uh, measured over four or five time points uh, in order to get a model like this. Um, so yeah, and this is an interesting growth model in itself in that it has two pieces, two, um, two growth pieces, so reflecting different time points. So you've got one, a growth piece representing kind of the first three years, and then a second piece representing kind of the last, oh, sorry, the first four years, and then the second piece representing the last three years. So it breaks it up. And that's probably because the, these uh, researchers thought that there might be different uh, influences of that change at different time points, because it's, it's, you know, reflecting childhood years versus adolescent years or something like that. So that's, that's where I think the three or the four advantages of running these types of models in structural equation modeling um, are useful for us. So hopefully um, that was really a very quick, um, probably confusing overview of what a multi-level model is, what a growth model is, and the advantages of using growth models in that structural equation modeling framework. So now I wanna put that, um, to rest and actually now start showing people how you can do this in M plus. And I'm gonna go over a few things. I'm just gonna show you what uh, the data frame might look like in order to run these structural equation modeling approaches to growth modeling. I give a quick overview of M plus syntax, uh, what it all means, and then do a few examples of running an unconditional, that means just a growth model without kind of predictors. Uh, so a linear growth model, uh, that is just a straightforward linear slope change over time versus a quadratic growth model, which shows that there is some kind of bend in the change. And then also run a conditional linear growth model, which is including predictors into the model. And those predictors in this instance was membership to either an intervention or control. So a traditional RCT setup. And then if we have time, um, talk about this idea of conditional piecewise growth. And, uh, this was a model 
example of a piecewise growth where there's two pieces representing growth rather than uh, one. So hopefully I can show you all that stuff. So hopefully everyone can now see M plus in all its glory. Um, but first I wanted to show you how the data is usually set up. And M plus, um, it's not the best for handling data, I gotta say. Um, in order to handle data, I would probably use another program like SAS, SPS, S or R. Um, and I would get the data set up in a way that's suitable for analysis in M plus prior to then actually loading it up into M plus. So what M plus takes is it takes a, a, what's known as .csv files or kind of comma separated values. Um, and they can be opened up in easily in Excel. Uh, there's no variable labels. You don't need variable labels for an M plus data set. So no one has any idea what these variables are except for the person who actually created the data set, hopefully. Um, and what you do is you specify um, what each of these columns are in the syntax. So you start off with what's known as a, a data statement um, and you specify what the file is and you just say file is auditcc.csv and that's this file. And if you save your syntax in the same folder as the data file, you don't need to put anything else in. It'll just look in that folder to start with and see if there is a file that's is called auditcc.csv and it will just use that. The next statement is the variable statement. And this is where we have to label all our variables. So M plus knows what each column is um, that separated by um, commas um, and what, what, the what the labels you wanna give them in order to use them in the additional kind of model statements. So all we have to do then is say names are, and then you say what each of the variable names are. You can make them up. So this one is the ID. So that represents person ID. And here we see each row represents a single person. Uh, then we have school. So what school did they come from? Um, we have three, four dummy variables representing um, group membership to an intervention. So climate prevention, cap control. Um, then we have our, in this case, we have seven measurements um, across seven different time points measuring the kind of the audit um, and whether or not someone scores high on the audit or not. Um, and here, so they, they're usually treated as zero and one uh, because this is a binary kind of analysis. Um, and then the next statement, and so we always finish the statements with a semicolon. And then the next statement is called the use variable statement. So we've listed all the variables that are in the data set, but you don't have to use all those variables in this particular model. So in this particular model, and I'll go to the one that I'm gonna show an example of. In this particular model, all we wanna use is the seven audit measures for each person. So we just say use variables are audit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, semicolon. Now, the next statement is we have to specify what distribution these variables are. Are they kind of normal continuous distributed variables or are they binary or are they categorical? Are they nominal? Are they count data? Whatever. In this case, they're binary data, whether or not they score high or low on the audit. Um, and so we just simply state categorical R, audit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, this particular analysis was done within schools. Um, and so we have to use this cluster equals schools. And I won't go into detail about what that does. Um, yeah, so forget about that at the moment. And then missing is, and this is where you say what the missing values are for your data set. In this case, our data set, we have a nine, minus nine indicates that that particular um, variable was missing for that time point. So the data, the M plus will look at the data set and any missing, any, any minus nine on those variables will be treated as missing. Um, then we have our analysis statement. And this analysis statement is we tell M plus what type of analysis we want to do. In this case, we're doing a complex analysis. Um, there's, there's no simple analysis. I don't know why it's called complex analysis, but I think it's because it deals with kind of um, um, complex clustered data. But 
regardless, that doesn't have to be there. I guess the simple analysis would just be removing that type equals complex. And then you tell the tell M plus what estimator you're using. And here we're using something called maximum likelihood and that R stands for robust. So what that means is that we're running a maximum likelihood procedure, which generally does require normally distributed um, variables as the dependent variables. But if we use this version of it called robust, it's actually quite robust against non-normality. So if we specify that, then we don't really have to worry about how non-normally distributed our variables are. I mean, in this case, we're dealing with categorical latent variables. So we use another type of estimator entirely. So then the, the next thing is the model statement. And the model statement is basically the language that you have to write in order to replicate those pictures that I showed you. So hopefully I can show you a uh, side by side. This one. So basically what we're saying in the model statement is we're writing I and we're writing S, which represent the intercept and the slope latent variables, these two kind of ovals here. And then we have to write a bar and a bar would tell us, okay, what tells M plus what, um, what dependent variables are being used to create these in intercept and slope latent variables. And in this case, we're using order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there are seven time points. Um, then we have to tell M plus what's known as time scores. So these are basically saying audit one was measured at zero, meaning it was measured at baseline or the first time point. Audit two was measured at 0.5. What's 0.5? Well, that's probably a six month follow-up if we're talking about this uh, in years. Audit three was measured maybe at 12 months follow up. So we say at one year. Audit four was measured at two years. Audit five at three years. Audit six was measured at five and a half years. And audit seven was measured at seven years follow up. And then this extra two lines, um, it's not necessary for these extra two lines, um, but I include them in here because it, it sets up the model so you can look at the actual value of the intercept. Um, but I won't go into detail about what that stuff means. Um, and then the output statements, you can ask M plus what output to produce um, and, and M plus will give you a copious amount of output if you don't tell it not to. Um, and then you can ask it to draw plots and I'll show you the plotting features on M plus aren't that great as I say, um, but you can run them if you want. So that's basically the whole thing to run that simple kind of growth model. Um, with the audit seven. And this is just a linear growth model. So each, each year represents, you know, consistent change over time. And to run it, you just quickly press run and it gives you this uh, matrix looking thing, um, which no one really pays attention to. And then it spits out the output. So just to go over some of the output, uh, because there's a lot, there's a lot of output and you can even ask for more. I mean, it just goes on and on. But what the output will do is it will reproduce your kind of your input statements. So you can see exactly what you've typed in. It will give you any warnings that pop up. The warnings aren't the greatest, um, but it, it, they do help you now and then. Uh, this one's saying that there is, um, there is one case where there's missing on all the variables. So that case has to be dropped because there is no way to include that that case in this if we don't have at least one time point measured. Um, M plus will then give you a summary of the analysis. So we'll say number of groups, we're only dealing with one group at the moment. Um, number of observations, we're dealing with 2,189. Uh, we've got seven dependent variables and those dependent variables are the change in audit scores over time. Uh, we've got no independent variables at the moment. This is just a purely unconditional model. Uh, we're just looking at kind of how the dependent variables change. And we have two continuous latent variables representing intercept and linear slope. We'll then provide you with a bit more detail so you know that you've done it correctly. So the binary and ordered categorical variables, um, the continuous latent variables, and then variables with special functions. In this case, we had to put in a cluster variable, which was school. Um, 
then it has kind of all the default settings of M plus. Um, you can just kind of just leave it. The default settings on M plus are really good. They've been studied really well um, and usually they work quite well. We then have um, kind of summary of the missing data patterns, uh, the proportion of data that are present, um, which are important, particularly for longitudinal data and you've got kind of dropout over time. Then it gives you univariate proportions and counts. So in this case, we're dealing with people um, who have high or low on the audit at each time point. And as you can see, it, it grows quite rapidly over time from 3% all the way up to 77%. You've then got your model fit information, uh, which basically tells you how well your data is fitting this linear model. And you can use these to compare uh, your, this model with maybe another model. So say if we want to fit a quadratic model and want to compare whether the quadratic model fits better than the linear model, we can use these values. Um, and usually the values, the smaller the value, the better fitting model is, the better fit of the model is. Um, and then we get actually into the nitty gritty stuff, which is the results. So it tells us the model results. And it's laid out in, in this manner where we have I, which is the intercept. Um, and that's fixed all to one because we only have one intercept, uh, which is kind of like the mean starting point on, on audit or the probability of scoring high on the audit. And then we have our slope and we have these numbers of where the changes happen. So baseline at audit one, six months, audit two, so on and so forth. Then we have this, uh, which is called the covariance or the correlation. So whenever you see a statement saying S with I with represents double, ar double headed arrows. So it usually represents correlation or covariance. So going back to the picture here, it's this. So we've just estimated the parameter for this relationship. And we can see that there is a negative covariance and negative correlation between slope starting point and any change. Um, and that is significant, really significant um, according to the two, two tailed P value. We then have a, a set of means. Now the means are basically the overall scores for those latent variables. So a mean of minus 6.254 for I represents that in our population, the mean probability of scoring high on the audit at the beginning is very low. People don't actually score very high at that time point. And then we have the mean slope. And again, this is just the mean of the overall population. At the moment, we haven't put any predictors in there. So we can see that as people go along in time, that slope goes up and we have a positive and a significant slope, meaning that it's significant to zero, it's not flat and it's going up like that. Um, so at each time point, the probability of scoring high on the audit, cent, uh, audit uh, C increases by 1.5. Uh, the thresholds, we've all fixed to zero, so you don't have to worry about them. And then we've got these things called the variances, which represent the differences in individuals uh, in terms of their intercepts, in terms of their slopes. And these don't have any kind of meaning for themselves, except the kind of the significance level. So if you want to look at the significance, you can say, okay, people differ in terms of their starting point from the mean um, over time. So because it's not different from zero, uh, because it is different from zero, we can't assume that everyone starts at the same point. We have to assume that there is a mean and people can vary around that mean. Same thing with the slopes, that we have a significant variance associated with slope. So we know that people don't just all stick to the average, they kind of vary over time. So that's kind of like um, the main findings of kind of a latent growth model. Uh, and you can also get additional things like confidence intervals around all those estimates. So you can plot your kind of estimate and your 95% confidence intervals. Um, and then there's a whole, whole bunch of stuff called technical output, um, which I won't go in. So that's kind of the overall um, picture of what kind of M plus can do in terms of running a growth model. 
And there are also a couple of additional things that you can do. You can get them to ask for plots if you want to actually plot out the kind of the growth model. So you just click on that fancy uh, kind of graph button there and you ask it to give you a sample proportions and estimated probabilities. And then in this particular one, we want to look at kind of uh, plot the estimated probabilities of uh, scoring high on the audit over time. Click finish. Um, and we want to estimate probability of scoring high. And it just plugs this out for you. So this is the probability from zero to one. Um, and this is the time points that we measured six months, one year, two years, three years, five and a half years, six years. So as you go, you can see it's going up in more or less linear fashion. You can also ask M plus to print out um, one of those kind of path diagrams. I've never could really figured out how to make this work. But I think you just do view diagram. And there it'll give you um, one of those path diagrams with all the kind of the values filled out. Although it looks pretty clunky. So you might want to go and use another program to do this. But that's an easy way to do that. So that's really a basic linear growth model. Um, in, in we can expand on that. So if instead of doing a linear growth model, we want to do a quadratic growth model. So say we want to see whether or not uh, the change um, kind of increases or there's a bend in the change. How we want to do, how we want to fit that model is we want to open up our uh, syntax. And the only difference between this and the linear model syntax is the addition of an additional um, latent variable that represents the quadratic change. So instead of putting I and S, we put in I, S, and Q. That's it. And that's a quadratic model. And if we run that, the, the thing that I want to point out here is when we run models, particularly with categorical data, um, it takes a much, <laughs> an exponentially longer amount of time to run when you have more latent variables. So the previous analysis only had two latent variables. This one has three to represent the quadratic change and it's taking a lot longer to actually do. If you have four or five or six, um, it just would take forever. In fact, I don't think um, M plus lets you do six latent variables when running categorical data as dependent variables. However, if you have continuous variables, um, it doesn't matter. The continuous variables um, are really quick to run and they don't suffer from as many problems as categorical variables. So that plugs out your quadratic model. And again, all the same output. And then we can use these values here to compare against our linear model to see which one fits better. Um, and then we can also look at our results to see how the quadratic changes, or how the, how, whether or not um, changes quadratic over time. And it doesn't look like it is um, because we don't have a significant quadratic uh, growth latent variable. Instead, we just have the kind of the in intercept and the slopes, which is significant. So you can do that. Uh, now I want to kind of wrap up by talking about uh, inclusion of predictors in these growth models, which is what most people are interested in when running these growth models. And so this is kind of what's known as a conditional growth model. And the differences in the syntax between this and the previous ones is we have to now incorporate these predictors. So in the use variable statement, we have the three dummy variables that represent the intervention groups. So climate, prevention, and cap. And because we're leaving out the control dummy variable, this assumes that um, we're comparing against the control. So this variable represents climate versus control, prevention versus control, cap versus control. And so there, that's the only addition in terms of the variable statement. You don't need to tell um, M plus that the independent variables are categorical. Um, if you've dummy coded them with zero and one, it will just treat them as binary. Um, so you don't have to tell M plus they're categorical. Um, and the other difference that we see is in the model statement. Uh, and we have kind of the intercept and the slope, which is all the same. That's, fit, that's running our growth model. And then what we want to do is we want to regress the group membership onto the intercept and slope. So you want to get uh, kind of this 
so see this this might be represented like as a as a predictor variable and we want to regress them so we want to have the arrows pointing on intercept and slope so that's why we have is on climate prevention cap and then all we have to do is run that uh, chris said can you run a cubic model yes you can run a cubic model um, by just putting in uh, instead of putting in i s and q you'd put i s q and c before the bar in that model statement and that will try and estimate a model with four latent variables and it will take a really long time to run so it's not the best to to do with categorical data but if you had continuous data you could easily run a cubic model um, so this is all the same again and if we scroll down to the model results or you, you, it always good advice just to check to see that you've done what you wanted to do so in this particularly one we have number of independent variables and three is popping up so it's recognized that we've got three uh, kind of independent variables um, and we scroll down to the model results and here we've got the results of those regressions that we wanted to look at so we wanted to look at climate versus control prevention versus control cap versus control on the intercept so is there any differences in uh, group membership at for their starting point where they start off and in this case no there's not uh, they're all non-significant and then we want to look at whether or not there is a difference in the change over time between uh, these three groups in control and so that's where we look at the s which represents the slope on climate prevention cap and we can see one is a significant um, finding the middle one uh, is borderline and the third is not significant and what we can see it's a negative uh, coefficient and when you see a negative coefficient that means that this particular group doesn't change as quickly or as rapidly as the control so what we're seeing is um, control are using more or, or scoring higher on the audit score as time goes on in comparison to climate which is a good finding in this instance because it shows that kind of our intervention is working in, in preventing people from um, scoring high on the audit as they get older um, and so that's that's kind of basically it so that's just a simple demonstration of how you might want to run growth models in a structural equation modeling framework um, the advantages of doing this type of approach um, the different types of questions you can answer i mean this is just a kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you can do um, and it's not that difficult i mean if you, if you kind of the syntax isn't that extensive and if and they've done a good job at trying to make it simple um, for people to use so that probably wraps up my spiel i'm sure everyone's probably either asleep or really confused but if anyone has any additional questions um feel free to chuck them in the question and answer group uh, um, question and answer tab or in the chat well i don't seem to have the chat on my bar anymore anyway um otherwise yeah thank you very much for listening um that's it i'll give people a few more minutes to answer it Paul. Uh, Paul says, from a data perspective, the deeper cluster data format is the more efficient and the easier for data management cleaning. Yep, that's correct. The format is easily converted to the structural equation modeling format with SAS anyway. Yep, that's, that's really spot on. Um, most people tend to use that long format data, which I talked about, uh, because it, it's easier, it's more efficient, it doesn't have as many, you know, columns it, it's just a better way of looking at it and then yeah there are ways to really flip between the two and in fact you can flip between the two in m plus if you have a long data set um, that you want to convert to a wide data set there is a function in m plus where you can just say i think it's like long to wide and you know tell it and it will flip it automatically for you um marie said most important to come up with a theoretical driven for for what you're testing yep spot on um, you definitely want to have some kind of theory that drives your analyses what what's the particular research questions you want to um, answer and then how you might want to answer that so if you believe that there are two kind of growth processes going on 
like it, the, the change might not occur that much during childhood, but it might change really strongly at, at adolescence, then you might fit a model that has those specifically those two pieces of change. Um, so that is kind of like your theory informing the, the models that you want to run and estimate. Um, so Chris says, sorry, Megan, does UCID have an MPAS license or is it extra software we need to request? Uh, yes, it's extra software that you need to request. I don't think, I don't think Sydney Uni has a, a uni-wide license. Um, it's basically, it's not that expensive um, for individual users to get a license. And if once you get a license, you can use it um, perpetually. There's no, there's no kind of limit to it. What the model that they've set up is, is you can buy a 12 month license, which gives, gives you the program and it also gives you access to any updates that they might make and any access to support. But once that 12 months is up, you can still use M plus or the version that you've, that you've got and you just can't get any support. Um, so if people want to use M plus, they can always use my version um, at work on my computer um, or look into getting, getting it themselves. And we've also got a couple of other, a couple of other licenses that are floating around from people that have used it previously. So if you want to use it, get in touch with either me or Tim or, or anyone else who's used it before um, and get um, a copy of it. Um, given the web-like appearance of some of the models, have you considered Spider-Man as an alternative for the Hulk? Yeah, I really weighed that up carefully about whether or not to put in Spider-Man given all those arrows and everything's going together. But ultimately, I wanted to go with the Hulk just because I like Hulk better than Spider-Man. Um, and Smriti says, I've never used M+. Uh, do you have any documents to share that would be good introductory material? Yep. Um, the M plus manual itself is like that thick. Um, so that's not very good for an introductory, you know, introduction to M plus. Uh, there are quite a few textbooks out there that are very specific in terms of focusing on, on certain things. So there's like a regression and mediation in M plus book. There's also kind of longitudinal analysis in M plus, which is a, a, a book um, in itself. Um, I've got copies of these things. There's also um, a lot of kind of YouTube, um, videos and seminars that are put out by the makers of M plus to really go over um, what the program can do and how to do it. And they're all on the M plus website. There's also a heap of papers looking into how to do fancy things in M plus. Um, but yeah, you just got to go hunting for some of those things or, or email me and I can flick you through if there's any spe thing specifically that you want to do um, in M plus, um, just let me know and I can try and find some examples or some material that might help you do that. Um, and Kylie said, I might be wrong, but thought M plus was a free package in R. Uh, yep. So it, that's, it's confusing because there is a package in R called M plus automation. And what that package does is it allows you to use R in conjunction with M plus, but you will need your own program of M plus first. And it is a standalone program that you don't have to have the R for. Um, so you can either use it in conjunction with R or you can just use it standalone. But if you want to use it with R, you have to have the program. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's it. So Lou just says, if any good resources, if people want to learn more about want to run these models. Yep, I don't have, I should have brought a list together for resources, but I didn't. Um, but just flick me an email and I can, I can send you some resources of people that just put seminars that are much better than what I did, did then. So yeah, um, there's no other questions. So that concludes the seminar. Thanks very much for coming along and listening. Um, and we'll see you for the next seminar. Bye.